One thing you know about Reverend John, you know, he loved to give assignments. And sometimes we follow them and sometimes we don't. But this particular service, this first Sunday each year, he gives some very, very special assignments. And those we are very much inclined to follow. I can't wait to hear what assignments he has for us. Pastor John, what you have for us this morning? Good morning. You want your assignment right off? No? Okay, let me build you up to it then. Good morning, my beloved family and friends. Happy New Year. And Happy New You. And Happy New Year. Happy New You to all those people who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. Welcome to part one of our two-part spiritual goal-setting exercise. Our tagline for the new year is, I focus on more being in 2014. Seen? <laughs> and for those unfamiliar with Jamaican colloquialisms, uh, we use seen as an exclamation, which means okay, or understood, or you, you get me? Sometimes you say, you see me? Okay. So we focus on more being in 2014. You see me? I'm standing here looking and seeing you, and you are radiant and shining and beautiful. I wish you could see yourselves. But it seems to me that if we want to focus on more being, then we need to learn to let go. Really let go, and let God direct our path this new year. I once saw a post-it on someone's computer over her mouse pad, which read, let go or be dragged. <laughs> and so I borrowed it as a title for this morning's encouragement. Let go or be dragged screaming into 2014. I regard myself as something of an expert in letting go. Every year at our spiritual goal setting workshop, I let go of impatience. I used to be so impatient to let go of impatience that I couldn't wait for the next year to come again so I could let it go again. It reminded me of my dad saying once, Cha, giving up smoking is easy. And he was a very heavy smoker. He said, so I said, you? He said, yeah, man, I do it every day. <laughs> so, you know, friends, after about five years of this futile letting go, it slowly dawned on me that if I had indeed let it go, I wouldn't have to be letting it go every year. I began to take notice, really take notice, of how hard it is for people to let go of old habits. Have you ever found that? Old hurts, old unwanted behaviors, even old worn out ideas and prejudices sometimes linger. People even cling to relationships that no longer work for them. Amazing, eh? I said, why do you stay with him? Well, can't swap black dog for monkey. I said, you neither want a black dog or a monkey. You need somebody to love you. I know a woman who is still crying over a boyfriend who walked out on her two years ago while she was pregnant with their child. All her friends advise her, let it go. Get on with your life, they intone. He isn't worth it. You can say that when it's not you having to let go. A young adult of my acquaintance still feels deep anger and resentment towards his father and mother for separating when he was a young child. Although his divorced parents enjoy a cordial relationship today, every time he attends a family gathering where the two of them are, like in you know, a family wedding or something, he gets angry again. And his siblings tell him, let it go. That's past history. And mom and dad have gone past it, so why are you still hugging it up? A client recently came to me for counseling and said, Reverend John, I know I should let go and let God, but how do I do it? That's the big frog to swallow. We know we should, but how do we do it? It's a good question. How do we stop hanging on to our compulsions addictions, and fixations. To answer this question, 
Let me use my own scenario of letting go of impatience. You know, I have found that instead of trying to let go of all of my impatience with everything, I am more successful if I practice letting go of little things as they arise. Letting go of impatience meant I had to lighten up and not take everything so seriously. I found I was able to do this by loosening my grip on things and by relaxing my inclination to try and control everything in my world. I don't feel really funny. My friend of mine was making lemonade yesterday and was taking forever taking out the, the, the pips, you know, the seeds out of, the, out of the, uh, the lemon. And I'm saying, make the lemonade now. We want to eat dinner. Make the lemonade now. I need to let go. You know, the lemonade will come. If you give in to this need to be in absolute control of taking out every pip out of the lemon and every aspect of your life, you will find yourself being dragged hither, thither, and yon in an exhausting, never-ending struggle to be on top of everything all the time. You can't be on top of everything all the time. <laughs> Some may buy it, some may sell it. So your first step in learning to let go successfully is to acknowledge all the ways in which you cling to old behaviors, beliefs, and ways of being, my friends. And so in preparation for tomorrow's goal-setting workshop, here comes the first part of your assignment. Should you decide to undertake it. I want you to spend some time today quietly noting, without judgment or any shame or guilt, all the feelings, habits, tendencies, and outworn ideas that no longer serve you on your spiritual path. You may be amazed at how much you cling to habitual ways of being in the world, regularly wallowing in mood swings, old regrets and grudges, and repeatedly indulging in stories of how you were hard done by. So jot down on a piece of paper anything that no longer serves you and bring it with you tomorrow evening. Jot down anything that no longer serves you, not anyone. Because this is not about other people, this is about you. At the appropriate time tomorrow, these bits of paper will be collected and taken outside and burned, symbolizing your freedom from them forever. You see, on some level, we all repeat self-destructive patterns in our lives, don't we? One woman told me that she's forever entering into relationships with unfaithful partners. What is it that she's holding on to that allows her to repeat this experience? Could it be a view of herself as being unworthy? In addition, after talking with her for a while, it became clear to me that she definitely was holding on to a deep-seated fear of being alone. She'd rather have anybody with her than be alone. Could it be then that she was willing to tolerate anything just to have someone? So we've been working together on letting go of her fear and replacing it with love for herself. Louise Hay uses a lot of I love and appreciate myself as, as a way of just, just beginning to nurture yourself and to love yourself and to be able to live with yourself. So every time you look in the mirror this week, I want you to just say, I love you. I love and approve of you. People with codependency issues also have trouble letting go of the tendency to overprotect their loved ones, and they often resort to nagging, arguing, or manipulation in their attempts to hold on. They need to learn, too, that letting go in a relationship doesn't mean loving less. You know another challenging area for many of us? It's letting go of failed relationships and lost loves. Many people feel so nostalgic for what they term the good old days that even when that nostalgia is based on, on illusion and on selective memory and fantasies about the past, they still hold on to this, this myth that the past was wonderful. 
If you want to have a better sense of where your old unwanted baggage is stored, it will help you to look to places where you have the hardest time letting go. Some people have a hard time letting go of money. Others are challenged to let go of their youth, while many others cling tenaciously to the belief that they are always right. Many people are challenged, too, to let go of jealousy, bitterness, resentment, and fear, carrying deep negative feelings that gnaw at their very core. And here is the biggie on forgiveness. Holding on to old hurts and refusing to forgive. Unforgiveness keeps many of us chained to the past and the past's unhappy memories. For many of us, much of our sadness at or dissatisfaction with life can be traced to our inability to forgive others as well as to forgive ourselves. We keep beating upon ourselves. When you look in the mirror, say, I love and I approve of you exactly as you are. Damn, you're good. Okay, if you don't want to damn, bless, you're good. And yet the concept of forgiveness, my friends, is espoused and promulgated by all the great religious traditions, and all of them recommend that the spiritual seeker should let go of the negative and embrace and move forward with something positive, wholesome, and life-affirming by forgiving the self and forgiving others. And so if there's someone you need to forgive, just do this simple forgiveness exercise today. Simply close your eyes, mentally see that person in your mind, and then say, I totally and freely forgive you. I totally and freely forgive you. Go free to your greater good. <laughs> Worth a try? Friends, we can let go of destructive physical habits and take up a healthier lifestyle. And people tell me, yes, I know. And when I look on their desk, there's a Pepsi. <laughs> Big. We know we shouldn't be having it, but the old habits are hard to break. We can let go of the belief that there may not be enough by practicing generosity. We can let go of anger and replace it with love, inclusiveness, and compassion. It's easy to love the ones that are loving us and that are close to us. When we need to practice love is when that little boy comes to the traffic light and without asking your permission, starts to wipe your windshield. One of my own challenges, I used to put the window up as soon as they approached. Now I put the window down and give them a blessing. You see, you have to make an, a conscious effort to do things differently, to break the habit. <coughs> we can let go of judgmental attitudes in favor of more tolerant and open-minded points of view. We can let go of the need to control everything and everyone and learn to relax our tight stranglehold on our perceived reality and go with the flow of life as it comes. And do it the way I'm doing it with impatience. Let, impatience. let go of the little things. Do it in increments, one step at a time. So when we practice letting go, our New Year resolutions become New Year evolutions as we awaken to our spiritual magnificence and consciously grow spiritually in grace and in truth. Let us say together, I am growing spiritually in grace and in truth. Can we say that? I am growing spiritually in grace and in truth. Right here and now, I let go and let God. Together? Right here. here and now, I let go and I let God. I let go of fear and lay hold of love. I let go of fear and lay hold of love. I let go of the past and lay hold of the present. I let go of the past and lay hold of the present. It is God's gift and I give thanks for it. I let go of anything that belies my divinity. I let go of anything that belies my divinity. And today lay hold of the truth about me. And today lay hold of the truth about me. That truth is perfect God, 
perfect person, perfect being in 2014. That truth is perfect God, perfect person, perfect being in 2014. Wow. Seen? <laughs> Dr. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching known as the science of mind, writes in his textbook of the same name, it's page 233, paragraph 4, and I quote, if one would take time once a day at least to let go of all that is not true and lay hold of reality, let go of doubt, distrust, worry, condemnation, fear, and lay hold of life in its expressions of beauty, truth, and wholeness, his mental congestion would be healed. I'm just now healing a cold. I'm hearing several other coughings around the, around the, the sanctuary this morning. Maybe we need to heal the congestion by spending a little time just laying hold of the truth of our spiritual identity. Perfect God, perfect man, perfect woman, perfect child, perfect being. Say, say perfect God, perfect and call your name, perfect being right now. Perfect God, perfect John, perfect being. This is the truth. And so it is. And so the final part of your assignment for tomorrow's workshop is this. You remember you have noted all the unwanted habits and behaviors that you don't want uh, to take into the new year. And you're forgiving anyone that needs forgiving. The next thing I want you to do is to make a gratitude list of all the good that you have been blessed with in 2013. Now, I started that last night, I've reached 100. You're not, going, you're not going to do less than 100. At least 100 things that have been good for you last year. And if you were at last year's workshop, you can review the list you made um, of your desired good. And beside each item that has been a demonstration, write, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. If you don't have a list from last year, make a list of your blessings in 2013. And beside each one, write, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. You will have an opportunity tomorrow evening to come up and share briefly the blessings that you are especially thankful for. But I want you to do that exercise today. Really look at all the good that has been yours. And you're going to be amazed at the avalanche of good that has been pouring into your life. But you know what? We only think about the time we buck our toe. We don't think about all the good times, do, do we? So we need to practice looking at the good and giving thanks for it. If you don't keep a gratitude journal, and I know many of us do, I recommend that that be one of your spiritual practices for the new year. Keep a gratitude journal, and every day at the end of your day, write down at least five things for which you are grateful. Because you see, the, the universe really increases and multiplies what you give thanks for. This practice of daily gratitude then will cleanse your mind and consciousness of old, unwanted ideas, feelings of lack, limitation, unworthiness, and will enable you to let go of states of mind and consciousness that cloud your awareness or interfere with your ability to think and act creatively. Give thanks. Give thanks. In all things, give thanks. In addition to letting go and practicing gratitude, begin to cultivate the consciousness of always having what you want and require. And I didn't say what you need, because when you come from a consciousness of need, it is suggesting what? I, I don't have it, that's why I need it. What you require. I remember uh, uh, Dr. David J. Walker saying that once he went to tea when he was a young minister, and the lady said, how many lumps of sugar do you require? And it was during the war years when everything was rationed. And he, saw, he thought to himself, damn, yes, I require three lumps of sugar. Not that I want it or not that I need it. I require it. It's what, it's what I, I, I require to make my tea tasty. So think about your requirements and think of them as already being provided by the universe. Privately nurture the aspirations you have for 2014, but don't discuss them with others who may not be as positive and goal-oriented as you, or who do not share your vision of great possibilities. If you have close loved ones who don't share your positive mental set, invite them to the workshop tomorrow afternoon. 
Purposeless or superficial talking about what you intend to accomplish really just scatters and dissipates the energy. So instead of talking about it, visualize it as an accomplished fact in your own mind. Make sense? When you let go of the unwanted baggage of the past, begin to attract what you want by imagining, feeling, and believing that you have it. And your mind, believe me, which is part of the one mind God, begins to bring it into manifestation. All your good comes through you, not to you. Fenwick L. Holmes, brother to Ernest, in a book he co-authored with Masahuru Tanaguchi, titled The Science of Faith, gives this advice, and I quote, learn to relax and let God do it. Believe that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, as Jesus said. If you can let go your fears, depression, doubt, inferiority, then faith exaltation and belief in yourself will automatically grow and express in your life." Unquote. The authors tell the story of Satakoma, a geisha girl who was studying art but not showing the desired progress. <coughs> her tutor constantly upbraided her for her lack of progress saying, this is no good, you're no good, you're not getting it. The oftener she heard this, the more apathetic she became. And with this mindset one day, she was walking to her tutor's home for a class when all of a sudden, her attention was caught by something written on a blackboard at the entrance to the local branch of Sai Chono Ai, which is Japanese for science of mind. The sign read, and I quote, <coughs> it is better to believe you can become something rather than make something of yourself. It is better to believe you can become something rather than make something of yourself." Unquote. As Satakoma stood there, the real meaning of the lines dawned on her, and she thought, these lines may help me. I had become so anxious about success in my art that I had no confidence in myself. I never thought I can. All along my way of thinking has been, I must do it well, but I can't. But here it is written that one had better believe one can rather than wish to do. Well, I will let go of my old belief that I can't and study today believing that I can. And I want to say to our young people, sometimes you open a textbook and you think, if it's a hard subject, you think, oh, this is hard, I can't. If you say you can't, that is going to be the truth for you. So you need to begin to say, I can. I can because I am. Can I hear all the young people say, I can because I am? I can because I am. We never ask the people over 50 for so you know. <laughs> Let us all say it then. I can because I am. Of course, you know the end of our story, Satakoma's story. She went to her tutor's house and found her lesson much easier because she was now thinking, I can. Soon she was frequently hearing her tutor say, you have done well today. And eventually, she mastered her art. Satakomo's story, though simple, contains an important lesson you can use in your own life. It is a valuable secret which ought to be known, especially by parents, caregivers, and teachers in bringing up children. It also should be known by people managing their own business enterprises and also in the spiritual growth that we are all aiming for. The secret is this. Let go of merely wishing to do it and believe you can do it. Holmes and Tanaguchi write, and I quote, the will says I am determined to do it. I shall make an effort. I will put up a struggle. But faith says I believe I can do it. I do not have to struggle, I only need to know. The beautiful Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's a wonderful thing when we learn to believe and depend upon the power within, rather than upon human effort. I will do expresses will, I believe I can expresses the power to accomplish. 
In Philippians 4, verse 13, St. Paul gives us this beautiful affirmation, which I want us to work with this year. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as you say it, my friends, I want you to remember that the Christ is the father-son, father-daughter relationship that you have with God. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It refers to the relationship that you have with your father which dwells within you. So can we say together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have faith in faith. I have faith in faith. Belief in belief. Belief in belief. I can because God in me can. I can because, because God in me can. I can because God as me can. I can because God as me can. To your neighbor say, you can because God in you and God as you can. You can because God in you and God as you can. In Quiet Talks with the Master, a wonderful book by Eva Bell Verber, the indwelling presence gives the reader this assurance, and I quote, Be very still, and soon shall open the heaven of my fullness, and such a glory shall fill your days as you have never dreamed. Then shall you know the kingdom of heaven is here and now, in both the spiritual and objective planes for those who love and serve and fulfill the law. Again I say, peace, quiet, expectant waiting, and it shall come to pass in the twinkling of an eye, the making of all things new for you." Unquote. And so friends, I know for you and yours, the making of all things new. Let go with the assurance that you need never again be dragged into unwanted habits and experiences. You were born to succeed and you can because God in you and God as you can. Tomorrow evening, we're going to participate in a simple ritual together to symbolize our support for each other's intentions as we seek both individually and collectively as a spiritual community to focus on more being in 2014. Seen? Namaste.